Nigel D presents. Yo, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to uh, be standing up here, actually for the second time. I interviewed Game one time before, just about our run of show. And at that point, you know, we didn't have a lot of time uh, sort of invested, but it was still a significant body of work. So tonight I stand here a decade later from working with my brother Game, and I'd like to bring him up right now and share a couple of little moments. We're going to keep it light because we're going to get to an incredible movie that has been put together like a behind the scenes kind of, you know, extravaganza. I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on it, but uh, I'm excited to see it. I hear I'm in it. So, you know, autographs afterwards, I'll see you outside, it's cool. Um, yo, all that to say, let's bring up the game, man. Where are you at, man? Stand up, bring it. Tell me what this moment was like to have, obviously, somebody that you, as a mentor, as somebody who believed in you and your vision. You know, from, to, being to a, from being, like I said, from being a young kid and, and only being able to see uh, Dr. Dre or Easy if they was riding through the hood or if it was, uh, you know, a toy drive or Thanksgiving turkey, something like that. To go from that, you know, being on the receiving side, you know what I'm saying, to being right under Dre, being able to study under Dre and him being my mentor, um, for me, has always been real huge to me. And uh, man, Dr. Dre, man, it does. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really get more 100 than Dr. Dre. And a lot of people might have shit to say about Dre, you know, this way or that way. Just don't say it out loud if I'm around, because it's gonna be a problem. Because that dude really gave me an opportunity to be something, you know. And uh, a lot of people don't really. People don't come along in everybody's lives and, and give them an opportunity to change their lives and you know so uh, you know su such like catastrophic proportion. Like what he did for me was like major. You know what I'm saying? It really helped mold me. It really helped keep the legacy of my city going. It, it helped you know cats like YG and Kendrick get on. Just just Dr. Dre. So you know a lot of people think the headphones when you say Dre or he got a billion dollars and that's cool, man. Dre still wears the same outfit, same white Air Force Ones. Um, he got a billion dollars. You can't really see it if you see him because he don't wear jewelry and nothing like that. And he, if I call Dre, pick him on the first ring and you know game time. And you know yeah, I got Dre's voice down. And um, that's it, man. So this that right there, man. It, it, that was man, me, man. And I loved it, man. I appreciate you for just documenting that. Oh man, I mean it was an honor. This is this is actually, and he's one of the main reasons why I'm sitting here. And so he, in a roundabout sort of way, gave me the same opportunity because. Yeah understanding what that was and wanting to learn more about that and the doc and whatever. And, you know, a kid from Cleveland, we pulled from the West Coast and the East Coast yeah. and down South, but the West was always that special sweet spot, man. Um, when, I, when I first started rapping, I, I didn't really know how to count bars, so I didn't know what 16 was. I didn't know you had to have an eight bar. I didn't understand that. I thought like you rap until you got tired of rapping and then that was a song. So in New York, they call that freestyles in LA. They call it this dude crazy because I, I my first demo like didn't even have no it didn't have no hooks because I just didn't know when to stop you know what I'm saying and so the thing was when I was recording um, the engineer used to just be like yo when it, the song is over it's like three minutes thirty seconds we're good I didn't understand any of that man so when I signed the Interscope um, the first two years of my of me being signed it was basically a bunch of arguments with Dre. Cause he would try to stop me from rapping and I would be like, no, that's like, I want to rap more. You know what I'm saying? And so when, when we did the documentary and we finished the album and uh, I had a conversation with Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, they said he was bringing this cat from New York to take photos um, and do this documentary in my hood. And he, his name was Jonathan Mannion. Um, I didn't even understand that you needed like a whole production, you know what I'm saying? An album, photo shoot. I, didn't, I thought like you go somewhere downtown, take a picture and then they, use that as the album. So I met Jonathan Mannion, man, and uh, I was like, we going to Compton. I don't think that, uh, had you ever been to Compton at that point? Yeah, I mean, I shot quick around the corner from your house in Hell, 2002 yeah, yeah. for so, Under the Influence. Yeah, you know, was, so I, knew, I asked for the, actually, it jumps around a little bit, but, you know, you know, we're gonna, we sit up here and we just have conversations like this. This is how it's gonna go. This is a conversation, this isn't statistics. Y'all can go online and check all that out. So this is like real friendship thing that's going down tonight, but, Look, I called you up because I wanted to make an important statement yeah. straight out of the gate. We had amazing conversations, um, you know, back and forth, and you were kind of giving me your perspective. You're like, look, I'm not here without the people that kicked down all the doors ahead of me. It's NWA, it's a DOC, it's, you know, Big Daddy Kane, it's everybody, it's that whole generation. And I said, look, you know, let's, let's make sure that this message doesn't get filtered. 
you know what I mean, through, you know, label concerns or, oh, that's too many guns or right. that's a lot of weed on the table. You know, like, I, I asked you for the address and I was like, look, I'm just going to show up a day early and we're going to rock. And we did some of the most important pictures, actually, in the whole, you know, session and some of the ones that are, you know, truly legendary today. Yeah. Which I'm going to jump to, man. I want to I wanna show you because I want to know your feelings looking at these pictures of where you were at this moment, right? So I'm going to jump. I'm going to give him a little intro there because he probably needs an intro. He, he's a new artist, man. He's coming up in the game. Now. So this dude right here started with, with probably one of the biggest like entry points into the game of, of anybody ever, like most anticipated. It wasn't like, he's got a buzz. Yeah, we're checking for him. It's like, no, this brother is the chosen one. <laughs> like, and he's coming, you know? And, you know, certainly he stayed well surrounded by various and assorted people that were you know, creating hits, major, major at that point. And for me to have documented this moment and to kind of learn a little bit about him before I even really had a conversation about the album, you know, we were shooting for XXL and we created images, man, that I don't even know if you remember, but I really knew at this point, I was like, oh, the kid's got it. You know, not to mention I'm shooting Eve and Busta, who I know is on the album, and Dre on the album. You know, it's like, this is incredible. And this is sort of, you know, that early moment from that day, and it's sort of, I'll let you pick it up from here. But this was one of the shots that we just did on our own. It was me and my crazy ass in Compton with two equally crazy assistants showing up to create magic, but with reverence at the core of everything that we were doing. Yeah, that's, that's, this, this picture right here is funny because um, the, the first thing I noticed is that I didn't have on the belt. So at this time, for, for some reason, I was, I was 23 years old and I thought like, I had this concept. I was like, I'm gonna wear belts because can't nothing hold me. You know, that was, it was my thing. That's <laughs> game, that is 100% game. It was done, but it was, that was my thing. You know what I'm saying? So I just didn't wear belts because I felt like, you know, that was too much like hold me back. You know what I'm saying? So every time I see pictures from that day, I, like, it's, it, it's so, it's, it looks so stupid. <laughs> but it mean. worked for those that needed that in that moment. Like, yeah, you set trends. Yeah, I mean, so, you know? For, you know, most people look at picture, look at this picture and they thought, you know, this, this dude is hard, he's young, he's from Compton. I look at it, I see the no belt thing that I think was just stupid. And I see my hair was bald. At that time, I wouldn't grow my hair because I was like low key ashamed of having like good hair. You know what I'm saying? So I thought like, you know, you young, be hard. Like, let me just have bald hair because if I grow my hair, it gets curly and then niggas ain't gonna like really believe that I'm thugged out. So I just kept it bald hair for like five years. Man. Well, look, I, I think that they would believe that you were for real, man, when we took this picture. This is also day one. This is actually. This is a life-changing picture for a lot of people. A good friend of mine, Andrea Andrews, 63-year-old woman, handful of years ago, man, an educator, like brilliant mind attached to higher forces. She walked and she was like, oh man, I knew who both of you were in that moment for documenting this thing. Yeah. Well, what's funny about this is this picture started off, um, this is a couple other shots from it, but it started off as you eating a bowl of cereal. Yeah. But thanks to your friends that you were surrounded by and you were well surrounded on that block yeah. for many reasons, but like they contributed like, yo, you got, with cereal, you got to have a little bit of weed. And if you got a little bit of weed, you got to have a little more. And then you got to have a gun to protect the weed. And then it just like builds up. But this was one of those moments that like built organically out of nothing. Yeah. Tell me like where you were in, in your mindset with this. Um, because this is like by any means necessary Yeah, we 2.0. We did this photo shoot in, in our dope spot um, in Compton. And, you know, my brother's still staying in the house to this day. But God knows what reason I've been asking, him to, you know throwing the towel for a minute, but that's just, I guess he loved it, man. He wanted to die there, so um, that's what he do. But uh, in this moment, man, I just was in my element because every morning at that point, and at this point, the documentary was completed and we were just shooting photos and I had a little money, but I didn't really see no um, point in moving out the hood. So this is where I was waking up and the only person, like my mom would call me every day or chirp me, because we had chirps at that time. Mom would chirp me and just say, are you stupid? You need to move off of that. Room. You need to move off of that block. You're dumb. You're a star now. I'm like, all right. And uh, yeah, man, this, this is me every day, man, basically. Yeah, man, and look, I, I have to say, man, it's it's been a privilege, man. A lot of people, you know, they kind of run through their course and they kind of change and become something else or different or like kind of push you to the side and, you know, get new crews and stuff. Like you've always maintained what's been an honor. And again, I'll touch on it, you know, to see the same faces that you're surrounded with. Man, that's yeah. a testament to your character, the way that you let people into your world, you know, 
on TV and otherwise, and you touch people on the Robin Hood project. Like these are all things, man, that are like genuinely from you. These aren't like publicity stunts to be cute. Like, right. you know, I don't know, man. I'm up here anyway. And uh, we're gonna discuss some goodness, man. So yeah, man. This is this is. <clears throat> You know, I, I think about... This is the kid who yesterday told me, can he get dropped off at the mall to hang with his homies? Yeah. And I was he like, was, what, one at this was, point? He was one years old, man, and that was the only picture where he was happy. Remember that day he was crying? His I got a was, couple, though. I got a couple happy ones, but yeah, there's a couple crying ones, lower corner, <laughs> crying, but the, you know, but the flyest kid in all of uh, L.A. at that point with an N.W.A. shame to lie. But, you know, this speaks to, again, like reverence and paying, paying homage to, you know, like a little touch of maybe a Biggie cover. Yeah. You know, these were all little things that were very calculated while we still wanted to make it our own and to claim something, you know, that was beyond, uh, you know, just sit up against something on a stool or something. We wanted to bring in elements of culture. And this is probably, I would say arguably, one of the most, you know, important pictures in hip hop. And I know I took it and... You know, I can stand outside of myself and I'm fly and all that stuff. But like, you know, this is, you know, it's up there with DMX in the blood for me, reasonable doubt. Like these are the important ones. And I think that set a trend that certainly continued, you know, as did this. And it, this was the non happy A. That's the last time I seen my D'Angelo little things right there. <laughs> I ain't seen him in 10 years for sure. <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> Yo. You know, we use these as like points of reference and platforms to build upon, you know what I mean? And we kept on going through, you know, and, you know, I, I equate these tires, you know what I mean, to growth for you. And each time, and we've done it, whether a label came in like, oh, the tires again, dude, really? You didn't have any other ideas? Oh, you didn't? Like, get out of here, man. You know, it's like we're using these things as like sketchbooks, as point of reference for next stuff that we're going to build. You know, we do it because we feel like doing it, and it's us, and that's who it really matters to, I think. Yeah, and this, this is a, a picture two years later to when he was three years old, my son Harlem. I named my son Harlem because the first time I came to New York, Jim Jones picked me up and I thought we was going to the studio, but he took me on like a drug run. We went to like six apartments, collected money, and I, we never made it to the studio. And uh, so I spent my first day in Harlem, New York, never went to my hotel. He never took me to check in. That's the type of friend Jim Jones is, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I named my son Harlem because of that. And uh, so yeah, this picture right here is two two years later, and you can see my son smiling because he at the, at that point he was in a you know a rich kid a preschool, so he was happier, you know. And uh, yeah, John man, you, yeah, you kill it, man. We kept on doing it. All right, we had gold ones the first time. Little okay, we're going a little bigger. We got more. We got a little money. We do, do you know? Again, we went platinum. It was always about growth for me. It's always metaphors. It's not like that the tires had any special meaning. And maybe yeah. you can say, I mean, do the tires beyond I mean, West I think, Coast staples have a meaning uh, to you? I think for you know, the date wires, man, and just you know a good good year tire um, on an Impala. I think that uh, so there's so much, you know, so much West Coast lifestyle. Um, in that, you know what I'm saying? So many people have died over those rims, man. Cars have got jacked. People have saved for months and months trying to buy them. And I just felt like, you know, the Dayton Tire was just a timeline for me in my life. Like, it was just everywhere, you know what I'm saying, from my childhood. I mean, when Easy, you know, first put, you know, his, his blue six form Impala on gold Dayton's. I mean, after that, it was, everybody wanted that, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And, and you know, for NWA, and you know, for everybody I don't know, I know the movie came out and Straight Out Compton is doing his thing and whatnot, but to be a kid in Compton and to have gone to the Compton swap meet and, and really received toys from Eazy-E on Christmas and turkeys from, um, you know, MC Ren and Yella, like that, that's how I grew up and that's what it was. So, you know, the, the Daytons, man, they, they kind of symbolize where I'm from and who I am. Yeah, man. Moving on, we got more tires. We continued the tire theme. Yeah. We had a lot of tires at that point. You were, you were doing some tire movement at that point. This is funny. Even at three years old and even the cushy preschool, man, he was still having a little moment. I don't know if you remember this, but these are always so funny to see as a benchmark. Like, little did I know that he's just secretly getting family portraits out of me, like, at a shoot. So he was like, yeah, let the label pay for this. I still didn't have a belt, though. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm still a wild man in, in this picture, still in the same block, same house. Um, I, I, had, I had money this point and uh i still didn't move man i just love my block and i remember getting into a point where i was 
I was a huge rap superstar at this point, but I still stayed on my block. And before you would even come on my block at that time, you would get guns drawn on you as soon as you hit the corner because we stay on a cul-de-sac. And uh, they would just ask you who you're here to see. And if you wanted to see me, I, like it, it made me feel like a Nino and the Carter a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And, and even though now I look back at it, and you know, I was, we was all taking penitentiary chances. I mean, back then it was kind of cool to be like the boss or something, you know? I would, you know, venture a guess and just say that you are still the boss of a whole yeah. hell of a lot right now. Man. So that run has it. And the kids, they, they make you soft. Nah, we <laughs> talked about that a little bit, but yeah. yes, I, you still got it, man. You know, using that as a point of reference, you know, we felt that it was important to go back to the block. And, you know, we had a discussion before, just as we always do before any album, and it was about uh, being able to go back. There's a lot of people that aren't welcome back because of you know choices that they made and dipping out and not giving back, but you yeah. always are constant about giving, you know, but from a higher perspective, so. I always felt like, you know, I, I paid my dues in Compton. I grew up in Compton. I, you know, I lost two brothers to gun violence, I mean, gang violence in Compton. I mean, they dead in the grave. I got shot in Compton. My sister got shot in Compton. That was my block, and I always made it a staple to just tell myself and make sure there was no one around Compton and can't nobody tell me I can't come to my city, oh. to my block. It's not like a, it ain't a force field over Compton. You just get off the freeway, you drive through it if you want to. Um, I just felt like I paid my dues and that's, you know, my block is my block. So whenever I feel like going back, I go, I hop out. It's usually all love. And when I was doing my thing, when I was young, I was an asshole and I was a real, I was, I was stupid. And so everybody knows the real stupid game. So a lot of times that saves the new game because nobody really can trip. Yeah. I'm gonna touch on a couple things, man. We taking you kind of a little walk down memory. John made me do the no. I'm gonna say you made me do this Tupac reverse head. I mean, uh, <laughs> bandana shit. Got me looking like ancient mama, and I ain't like it. So the reason you've never seen bad. this shit is because he yeah. vetoed it. I vetoed it. You I saw it tonight, man. Take yeah, it. Man. Take, get that flick on. <laughs> you won't ever see it again. Sorry. That was, a, that was a job pop moment, like a pop rule. Yeah, but that was like hot at that time. I don't know. Hold on, my baby. <laughs> You're welcome. I um, always kind of just model my career. Um, in the footsteps of like Ice Cube and Dre, and you know, always look at them, and you know, I say Dre's 50, I'm 35, so by the time I'm 50, I want to be doing this or that, man. And, but I live day to day, so um, I live according to how I feel after I brush my teeth in the morning, because you never know when God is gonna remove you from Earth. So, man, I try to just live my life to the fullest. I'm more of like, uh, I'm into, I'm just so into, so into and so involved in my children's lives, man, that. Uh, I mean, I think in the next 10 years, I'm going to still be, you know, who I am at heart and uh, just a father, man. I just, that's all it's about for me these days. We're here to celebrate Documentary 2. I expect y'all to pick up that album. If you could give me one sentence about it, and I know that I expect the 10 more minutes and I'm not going to take them, but, yo, Documentary 2. All right. So what producer uh, inspired you the most to deliver the goods on this one? You know what, the, the, the producer that inspired me the most and is somebody that uh, I think is going to shock the game, man, and it, it, it's, uh, you know, Bongo. Bongo, uh, um, um, I met this dude through one of my homies, Marcus. He told me he was going to bring his dude through to play some beats. Whenever somebody says, I'm going to bring my homie through to play beats, it instantly makes you like, Fuck your homie. Because <laughs> I already know what it's going to be. It's going to be some nigga come through, play 90 whack ass beats. I'm going to have to sit there through him because I'm a nice guy, hear all this shit. But he came through, man, and he played this beat, man. And I mean, I instantly, I think we did the song we recorded, Made in America, in like 20 minutes, man. And after that, we, we formed this camaraderie, man, this friendship. And he ended up doing 85% of the album. And I mean, every time I play the album for somebody, whether it's Jermaine Dupri or Diddy or Dr. Dre, and they ask me, who did this beat? And then it goes to the next song. They say, who did this beat? And I tell them, Bongo, every time, man, they just look at him like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And like, it's, I think like, this, he one of the people that I've, been thankful to me. Like, I thank him when he's not around, just to myself. I'd be like, what the, what the fuck would my album sound like if I didn't meet this dude? You know what I'm saying? So, when you do get the documentary too, if you do, when you do, man, you understand um, that the production value that this kid got is amazing, man. It's, it's, he can do anything, man. And, and every time in the history of hip hop or music, when you meet somebody, a producer or an artist, a singer, or anybody, um, you know, musically that can do everything, they gonna have a you know there's longevity to that man so congrats man. Well, thank you.
Yeah, man. Well, congrats on your longevity, man. I know we got to get to this. A couple things I got to say about this. I've been